Hello, welcome to uh, the June 9th uh, episode of Mass uh, 2024 of Massachusetts Pirate News. Uh, I'm joined today by Stephen Eli. How are you two? Doing well. Thank you, Jamie. Doing good, thanks. Excellent. So uh, we will be at the Boxborough Pfeiffer's Day um, Festival uh, this upcoming Saturday, uh, June 15th. So if you want to come check us out or if you want to volunteer there, um, we'll have a, you know, come out to the table and help us table. Uh, we'll have a sign up in the description below. Uh, so with that, um, we also have a tech slash democracy meeting, as we call it, for democracy and dog food, which is a software ism for uh, eating your own dog food. So using your own software uh, on June 29th uh, at noon. So that'll be at our usual um, uh, usual uh, Big Blue Button video channel. We'll have a link to that as well. So um, we've got four topics today. We'll try and run through, through them as quickly as we can. Uh, first up, Steve, can you give us an update on the transfer tax idea before the legislature? Sure, Jamie, I'd be glad to. So just as a little preface, this is Massachusetts um, or Eastern Massachusetts. We have, you know, housing is housing around here is is really expensive. I mean, it's expensive everywhere, but um, we have some of the highest, you know, home prices in you know in the country, to, to be frank. And one of you know, there's a variety of reasons why things sort of evolve this way, but you know, it's it's not one of it's not something where there's really just one solution to uh, one solution to it. Um, it's it's a whole set of problems. But at any rate, one of the tools that we had been uh, that a, a legislature and and honestly, a number of uh, cities and towns within Massachusetts had been sort of looking at was something called a real estate transfer tax. So basically, this would be you know something that communities could opt into and if a community decided to opt in they would be allowed to basically put a tax on the sale of real estate um, it could be anywhere from you know a half a percent to two percent and you know it wouldn't be the entire value but just the portion of it that's over a million dollars or the average price of a home in the county whichever is greater so the idea is that um, you know you you know it's a it's a something a it's a it's a form of revenue that could be used to create uh, basically affordable housing and by affordable I mean income restricted so it's you know sort of a, a formality. This was our governor had put this in her um, you know in her bonding in her version of the bonding bill our. House Speaker, um, Representative Mariano was, you know, sort of seemed, you know, okay with the idea. And then the real estate, the real estate industry what doesn't like this and their lobbying efforts kicked in and now it is no longer part of the, uh, the House version. Uh, the Senate has yet to produce a version of the bonding bill and we'll see if it's in there. But unfortunately, it looks like this is something that's you know pretty popular with residents um, a number of municipalities including my own have filed home rule petition asking you know the state legislature for permission to do this uh it's a funny quirk about massachusetts if um you know cities and towns can only do so much we're, we're given sort of like a little box of what we can do and if you want to go outside of that box and, you know, unfortunately outside of that box is, you know, anything involving raising money is outside of that box. You basically have to, um, you know, ask the legislature to uh, write a law for you. <laughs> but, you know, this, we'll see if it makes it, the transfer tax is included, but um, as, 
you know, this isn't, uh, for people who supported it, this is unfortunately not a happy development. Yeah, I know Somerville, which is where I live, um, had it where it would be split between, if I recall correctly, it would be split between the buyer and the seller. And if either or both parties um, were owner occupier, either the person selling had lived there for a certain amount of time or the person buying was going to live there uh, or had indeed met whatever requirements that the money's put in escrow or something like that, they wouldn't have to pay the tax. It was really geared, and I don't know about other municipalities, but it was really geared towards um, dealing with speculators who are basically, I'm going to buy a house, make some changes to it and flip it or I'm going to buy it as an investment property or to either rent out or just have the value appreciate. Um, so there were protections for people who were, who were going to be owner occupiers, uh, but less so for speculators. Uh, the other thing that I, I love about Massachusetts is, you know, municipal rights. What are those? <laughs> Eli, do you have any thoughts? Uh, nothing you guys haven't already said. So. All right. Uh, so next topic is from Houston. Uh, the mayor uh, may very well decide to drop ShotSpotter. Um, Chicago is looking at dropping ShotSpotter in uh, September. Uh and basically, the mayor, John Whitmire, uh, said he wants to cancel Houston's $3.5 million shot spotter contract, uh, saying, I'll continue to call it a gimmick, he says. I think it was one of those programs that was implemented to make people think we're really fighting crime, but it doesn't affect the crime rate. Uh, so would that we had more municipalities that decided to do that since yeah go on yeah so there's um one of the things i i saw when reading uh reading up on that story was uh, shot spotter the company well they've uh they're no longer called shot spotter <laughs> it's when you're when your pr is bad enough that you have to distance yourself from yourself uh, they're, I guess they're called sound thinking now, but their product is still called uh, shot spotter. And just, you know, to, as a little refresher, um, you know, a shot, shot spotters product, they're basically microphones that are mounted, um, in different places around, uh, a, a community along with, you know, some infrastructure to, you know, hook it up to shot spotters, computer systems, but basically they're supposed to detect gunfire, um, where in, reality they tend to um you know they have a high they've tended to have a high false positive rate so uh backfiring vehicles um city buses that sort of thing and in the in houston's case they were you know they were set to they i guess have a three and a half million dollar contract um and you know they've found the devices to be largely ineffective at either you know solving or deterring gun related crimes and you know if they've it's also the product has also had come with the downside of at least according to their police chief um you know it divert has diverted off officers from you know other you know from other things including like burglaries in progress so you know kudos to houston <laughs> Yeah, it's a, people never factor in the costs of wasted police time uh, because, you know, if there's a gunshot, that becomes your number one priority and you have to go and investigate it, uh, even though there may be other things on the list that are higher than a false positive of a gunshot. But um, also something we didn't mention the last time, but we were thinking about doing it. Apparently, New York City, uh, the mayor there. Uh, wants to go and put um, shot spotters or similar technology within the subway system, which the CEO of 
the particular company said, yeah, it's not really designed to do that, you know, echoey environments and all. So yeah, that, that New York's mayor continues to be, New York City's mayor continues to be not the brightest bulb. Yeah, um, I was going to say, on a New York subway, uh, having ridden them, <laughs> you know, they're, they could be loud and rickety at times. So yeah, I, I think there would be like a lot of false positives, maybe, you know, whenever a train goes by. <laughs> Uh, speaking of going by, um, so Oral B has apparently they have a particular internet enabled uh, toothbrush, <clears throat> and you know you can use an app. I don't quite understand why to order Oral B products or something like that, but they built into it Alexa, Amazon Alexa, so you could talk with your Oral B. Uh, toothbrush toothbrush and and say hey go order me something or go do something for me or tell me what the weather is or whatever and so four years after they implement it they decided to remove that functionality so yet yet again showing that even when you buy products you really don't own them <laughs> they're at all yeah. for the internet yeah, I, I see two problems with this. One is, like you said, uh, a manufacturer removing a feature of a product, um, you know, that you've bought and paid for. And in this case, the second thing would be the fact that that feature ever existed in the first place. <laughs> why does why does your toothbrush need to be internet connected? I'm I mean, not sure what my you know why my uh, washer and dryer need to be internet connected. I really, it, it's like, you know, if you're, I, I don't, um, you know, I, I don't subscribe to the in-home, you know, uh, spy box uh, culture. But, you know, if you're going to ask Alexa, hey, Alexa, I need new brushes for my Oral-B electric toothbrush. You know, there's probably only, I would assume there's only so many different varieties of them, <laughs> you know, um, and you know, there's, or you know, once you order them, Am presumably Amazon could say, oh yeah, well you ordered, you ordered these before, so we'll just send you more of them. But yeah, the, the internet of things is, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a big, it's a big attack surface. That's, that's the way I see it. Yeah, not only that, but I mean, I, I know, I know where I live, like I'll routinely see an Amazon truck go by. And then some person out of either a rented U-Haul or their own car will just be go off and deliver Amazon packages. And I'm just like, okay, what was wrong with, you know, the postal service doing this or, or even UPS and FedEx? Now we've got random people going around delivering packages. So. Um, do you have anything to add, Eli? Is there something you wanted to add? Um, I'll be honest. I thought that like whole article was satire when I first read it because it, you know, it doesn't make sense to why a toothbrush would need that capability. And as you guys touched on, it is weird that since it has that capability it is being removed. Just, I don't know. It doesn't make too much sense to me in general. <laughs> so when you want to go, go and tell Alexa to like nuke Russia, you know? <laughs> You can't do that anymore from your oral B toothbrush. <laughs> so. Alexa, buy, order me 5,000 pounds of creamed corn. <laughs> <laughs> and deliver it to Putin. Uh, anyways, uh, the last one that we had uh, is the European, uh, the Court of Justice of the European Union uh, recently decided that uh, the general and indiscriminate retention of IP addresses does not necessarily constitute a serious interference with fundamental rights. So in essence, you don't have anonymity on the internet in the European Union because copyright, you know, all the copyright holders need to know exactly who downloaded what particular file somewhere or video file or image or whatever. Uh, a game, and then to be able to 
track them down and go after them and throw them in jail or find them or something. Deny them their the access, their their internet access. So yay EU. <laughs> Well, one of the things that's sort of funny about that is there are countries where uh, that do uh, warehouse every TCP connection that gets made within their borders, um, you know, or that goes through. They they're basically they require the telcos to the telecommunications company, the internet service providers, to just you know log that this IP address, you know, con you know connected to this IP address and poured at such and such a time. And, you know, there it's often framed, it's sometimes framed as being for national security, uh, <laughs> you know, and what we're like, what the um, doing, doing this under the guise of in, well, you want to enforce copyright, you're still doing the same, collecting the same sort of data and, you know, data you know data doesn't the data itself doesn't care what purpose it's used for but people can find creative ways of repurposing data <laughs> so it's um yeah the the fact that this is you know under the guise of well copyright protection is a little bit problematic but you know the fact that it's yeah, it can be used for other things <laughs> and none of which are good <laughs> is, is, is also an issue. Um, and with that shout out to our fellow pirates in the European union, the European union uh, is finishing up its every five year uh, European parliament elections. Uh, the numbers that I saw um, were that Germany had a, uh, that the pirates had half a percent in Germany, 6.2% in the Czech Republic. Those are the two countries that had collectively um, had four uh, pirates in the European Parliament in the previous session. Uh, so I'm not sure where those numbers are. Hopefully that means they will continue uh, to fight for our rights in the European Parliament. Um, because we, we certainly know with, with things going on that uh, with this European court ruling, we really need them. So, um, and with that, um, thank you both very much. Uh, hope uh, you folks watching us found this informative. Um, you know, you know what to do. If you can find us at masspirates.org, the best way to help is to sign up for our mailing list and get our email updates. Uh, so with that, uh, unless there's any other words of advice from the two of you. Yep. Uh, I hope you all have a, have a wonderful and pleasant evening. And again, hopefully we'll see you uh, this upcoming Saturday at Boxborough, the Box Boxborough Pfeiffer's Day. So we're looking forward to it. So with that, have a wonderful week. Stay safe. Stay warm. Well, uh, yeah, it is that time of the year. All right. Bye, folks. <laughs>